welcome to Scan Patch Vex and how to use open source tools to manage vulnerabilities in your container images. Uh, I'm Toby Moranov. Uh, I'm a principal product manager at Microsoft and I'm here with Itai. Hi everyone, I'm Itai from Aqua Security. I lead the open source stuff at Aqua, including Trivi, uh, the security scanner we'll talk about today. And we will miss uh, Sertac uh, today because he uh, got COVID, so unfortunately he, not, he cannot be here. And I don't know what updates are going on on my machine, so I would like to dismiss these things. Apologize for that. By the way, how many people attended yesterday the malicious compliance talk? How do you like it? It was good, right? Uh, that's the malicious way to actually reduce your vulnerabilities. What we're going to talk about today is uh, the more kind of standard way, which means that keeping you honest. But let's start with uh, this graph. I guess a lot of people have seen that um, over the past 10 years, the number of vulnerabilities that get reported in the uh, MBD database grew from around less, less than 10,000 or Five, five, six thousand to more than thirty thousand, and uh, what many people are really uh, worrying is like, how can I deal with all these vulnerabilities? Like uh, everybody is overwhelmed, more and more vulnerabilities get reported. The question is, how can I concentrate on really the things that I need to fix, and not all these big numbers that uh, my security team is constantly asking me to actually bring down. So we have, uh, I, I talk with many customers and normally the process that they go through is uh, when it comes to containers is they acquire an image from outside, uh, let's say Docker Hub. Before they allow their internal developers to use that image, they do a vulnerability scan and at least get some baseline on what vulnerabilities are acquired from the outside image. Uh, then they give it to the internal team. The internal team builds the application image. Of course, as part of the build pipeline, there is another scan that happens and uh, eventually a gate that says, oh, I, for example, do not allow this application image to be released because it has too many vulnerabilities. Uh, teams may file exceptions. Uh, they can say, okay, I'll fix those vulnerabilities in, in a month or in two months. Uh, and then they let the image actually go to the production. But once it ends on the production, it's constantly scanned because, of course, vulnerabilities show up every day. It's not like you scan it once and that's it, so. Here we will actually, what we're gonna show in this uh, talk is, uh, we will take a sample application which is based on Python-based image that we will pull from Docker Hub. Uh, we'll build uh, on top of this Python-based image our application image, which will be Flask-based. And what I'm showing here is like how many vulnerabilities you get from the Python image from the get-go. So if you look at the number here, we have like 1,500 vulnerabilities the moment I actually pull the image from Docker Hub. Of course, not all of those 1,500 vulnerabilities has fixes for them. Uh, if we want to only look at the uh, vulnerabilities that have fixes, those are 98. But sometimes your security team will hunt you down for all the 1500, so you need to figure out how you can actually get this number down. Uh, those are the numbers after we build our application, so you can see that 1,500 come from the Python base image and as part of the code that we add on top of the Python base image, we add seven more vulnerabilities. And if we filter by unfixed ones, we still keep the 98 vulnerabilities that still have fixes in the Python image and the seven one also have fixes for our application image. So what we wanna go through is to show how we can uh, use a funnel to actually narrow down this number and really make sure that the developers concentrate only on the vulnerabilities that they need to fix, okay? Uh, the screenshots that we took, they are from last week. Those numbers changed from last week. So let's go and actually set up our environment and show what are the numbers as of today. 
Uh, so start our demo script. It's a live demo, so hopefully internet will be good. Uh, we'll set up our environment. So as I said, we'll have a base image which comes from uh, 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 Docker Hub. It's the exact same Python 3.12.2 image that's in Docker Hub. We just imported it in uh, our own uh, repository because we want to also push some information to Docker Hub. And we'll have our application image stored in GHCR. And we are setting up some, some folders. Uh, uh, it I will go through those. And if I run Trivi right now for the base image, and I'm filtering only by high and critical, so I don't want to see all the big numbers. Let's concentrate on the high and critical. So we have 165 high and critical vulnerabilities in the base Python image. And we have those 165 high and critical vulnerabilities in the base image and the three vulnerabilities that uh, we introduce as our uh, application. Now hand it back to Itai, so he will talk how we can use VEX to figure out uh, uh, how we can filter some vulnerabilities using VEX. Go ahead. Thanks. Okay, so uh, we're going to uh, take a series of steps. Each step will help us reduce the, the number of total vulnerabilities until we get to the end where we have a handful that we can actually do something about, uh, starting with VEX. Um, that was the this demo. Starting with VEX, what is VEX? Uh, by the way, anyone uh, attended the Adolfo's talk just uh, a moment ago in the keynote? Some of you? Okay, yeah, I see some nods. So uh, this is a, a, a quick repeat, but actually we'll take it a step further. Um, this is a, a, a real example from the Gradle project, you know, the, the build tool for uh, Java. Um, so in this example, um, someone opens an issue, you see on the top, that Gradle has a dependency on a library test ng, and they say that uh, they found that there's a vulnerability in test ng, and they're asking the Gradle uh, maintainers to patch it to do something with it. And, and then you see the response from the maintainer. They say, uh, I'm just going to read it out loud, uh, the version 631 of test ng does not have the necessary code path to produce the path traversal. And, and then at the bottom they say, I, I will close this issue as the CVE is not applicable. So basically the maintainer dismissed uh, the request, which is, I mean, fair enough. They did an investigation, an analysis, and they concluded that it's not applicable. The problem is that this uh, analysis and important information is now uh, contained, is now trapped inside of this GitHub issue. And if anyone wants to know about this, or if any tool wants to make use of it, this information, it's, it's very hard. You need to know how to search for it and what to do with it. And this is exactly what VEX aims to solve. It aims to help us uh, communicate this information in a machine-readable uh, way to our scanning tools. So VEX has three uh, parts. Uh, basically, uh, we describe what is the CVE that we have something to say about. We describe what is the product, like in the context of which product we are going to make a statement. Uh, and then what do we have to say about this CVE in that product? In our previous example, the CVE is this specific one, 4065. The product would be Gradle. We want to say, what do we have to say about CVE 4065 in the context of Gradle? We want to say that it is not applicable. This is what the maintainer uh, decided. So in a nutshell, this is the, this is the, 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 the interesting information that uh, VEX help us uh, convey. Um, VEX is just a concept. Um, it is not a tool. It is not a solution. It is not a protocol or anything like that. It is just a concept. There are different implementations available for this concept. We're going to use in this uh, talk uh, the OpenVEX implementation. Uh, we just think it's the simplest one, and if this is your first um, experience with VEX, this is a, a good way to get started. So we're going to use OpenVEX, but remember, keep in mind that there are other uh, standards as well. So OpenVEX is open sourced on GitHub. If you go there, you can find a lot of information. This is just an example for how a typical OpenVEX document <coughs> looks like. It's just a simple JSON. 
Um, there's a metadata section on top, and then we get to the statements part. This is the interesting part for us. And here we see the three, the three parts that we um, saw earlier. The vulnerability is being referred to here with its uh, CVE ID. The products that are affected, uh, in this case there's more than one, but it's actually the same one, different uh, flavors of the same product. Um, I should mention here that the product is being referred to using PURL. This is a, a, a conventional way to refer to software packages. It is unrelated to, to VEX or to OpenVEX. It is a separate um, uh, standard, uh, but it's very popular. And OpenVEX uh, actually strongly recommends to use PURL. Um, what is this PURL telling us? It's telling us that the product is an APK package for the Wolfy operating system. The package is Git, and we can further um, qualify it and say what's the version specifically, what is the, what's the architecture it was built for, etc. But basically we're saying this is the product that we are discussing, and finally what is the status? What do we have to say about this CVE in those products? That's a very a, a typical VEX document. So let's see what can we do about it. Um, remember the numbers, we are starting with 158 vulnerabilities in the, oh, sorry, 165 vulnerabilities in the base image and an extra three in our uh, code. So um, let's run Trivi for our application image and we're just taking a look at the vulnerabilities coming from the Git uh, package. Why? Because right now what we're trying to do is to take, to, to take the, the position of the Python maintainers. Let's say now that not the application developer, but the upstream um, developers can help us reduce the number of vulnerabilities because uh, like in the greater example, they can do a, some kind of analysis and say that, for example, the vulnerability in Git does not apply to, to Python. By the way, this is entirely contrived. So it's not to say that Git is safe, the, you should ignore the vulnerabilities, it's just an example. Um, but we see here a, a bunch of CVEs that are in the Git package. So what we're gonna do is to use the VEXCTL tool. This is part of the OpenVEX project. It's a CLI tool that helps us, uh, in this case, create a JSON document. You could have just authored the, the document from scratch. It's just a simple JSON document, but this is just a nice way to show uh, the tool. We're giving the tool the information that it needs to create the VEX, on, uh, the VEX document. We are, we are seeing here, for example, that we have something to say about the Python image, and specifically about the Git package in the Python image, and we are uh, creating a few separate statements for the different CVEs that we want to, um, to ignore in, in a way. And uh, for those CVEs, for this Git package in the Python image, we want to say that they are not affected. Because we, now as the Python maintainers, concluded that they don't affect Python. We can also add a justification why we think that's so. And you can see that each of those commands creates a file, um, a JSON file, um, that, uh, that uh, will now go ahead and take those uh, separate files and just for convenience merge them into one file so it's easier for us to handle using the uh, vexctl merge command. And I uh, just want to show you the result of that. This is, by the way, the script is running here, and it's actually a live demo, so it, it now created those files in this directory, so you can see here the individual files that were created, and now we'll run the merge command, which created uh, this uh, merged uh, one, and you can see here that under statements, now there is uh, several statements, which are basically the individual uh, statements from before. Okay, so we merged it. Um, what we can do now is basically um, 
store this VEX document along with the image that it is describing. So um, we're using another CNCF project uh, called ORAS. It's a CLI tool for uh, interacting with container registries. And we're basically asking ORAS to attach this open VEX document to the base image. Okay, it will actually store the JSON in the container registry, and we're giving it the path to the merged document. And it is running, and now we can take a look at, this is, uh, so this is our uh, image in Docker Hub, the Python image. I'm gonna refresh this now. And you can see this new thing here. This is what we just pushed. This is the JSON document in the container registry together with the image that it describes, okay? So we did that. And um, the next thing we need to do is, um, so we have now, uh, the, the, the Python community created a VEX document that describes the Python image, but we are not scanning the Python image. We're scanning our application that is based from the Python image, right? So if we just took the VEX from the Python image and applied it, try to apply it to our image, it would not work. We need to take an extra step and to uh, basically um, adapt the VEX that the Python community created and to say, we think this applies to us as well. We think what, what's good for the Python community, base image is good for my image as well. Okay, it's an active state step that we, as the application developers right now, needs to take. So this is um, basically a simple final replace uh, on, the, on the merged uh, VEX document. We are replacing all of the instances of the Python image with the name of our image. Okay, so we basically say what's good for the Python image is also applies for our image. And this will create a new VEX um, document here. You see here all the Python ones, and now there's a new one. The, Flex, uh, the, the Flask app one, it's the same thing, just different image name. Um, and now that we have that, we'll attach it with our application image, okay? Again, using Oras, and previously we've seen it in Docker Hub. Now this is on GitHub. This is my application. My, I'm, I'm the developer, right? So I'm working on GitHub. This is the, the, the image, and now I refreshed it, and we see the, the new um, VEX uh, being pushed to the Docker Hub container, uh, sorry, to the GitHub container registry as well. And we can finally make use of VEX for the first time. We're going to run 3V scan again. And the only thing different from before is this extra flag here. Sorry, yeah, this one. That is uh, saying, please consider the following VEX document. That's it, okay? And we'll give it a reference to the merged uh, uh, VEX file. And now you can see that the numbers have reduced. Now we have 160 uh, vulnerabilities in the base image because we have um, uh, we have ignored some, some of them using uh, VEX, and we still have three in our own code. Okay, so um, we took the first step, and uh, now, go back here. Okay, so we took the first step. We have removed everything that we could have removed uh, using uh, information from the community, using information from the um, layers uh, up in the stack that, that are not basically ours, that are others. Now we're going to take another step and to see what we can do to reduce uh, the numbers using the, um, our judgment, basically. So um, every scanning tool, I think, more or less have some way to allow the developer to ignore. Uh, some of the findings. Uh, there are different reasons why you may want to do something like, wh why would you want to ignore something that the scanning tool tries to tell you, right? 
Uh, there's some legitimately good reasons. Sometimes there's just, um, there is a vulnerability, there is no fix to the vulnerability. By the way, the Python image is based from Debian. Debian is uh, infamously known for a lot of unfixed uh, vulnerabilities. We just have nothing to do with it as developers, so we might as well just uh, skip those. Um, maybe it's just very low business impact. You know, there is a, technically it's a vulnerability. Yes, it qualifies as a vulnerability, but it really has no real effect. So we just deprioritize it and we choose to not see it anymore. Uh, maybe we do acknowledge it, but we have a backlog of things to fix and we just need more time. And maybe we need to uh, pass some kind of automated testing or something like that. So we just need to defer it until a later point in time. Maybe it's a false positive. It also happens that the scanning tool or actually the data that the scanning tool is relying on has a mistake. And it basically says that we have a vulnerability where in fact we don't have a vulnerability and we just need to get it off of the report. So there's different reasons. There are more reasons even. Um, and if we have a case like this, how would we do that? So with Trivi, there is a very cool uh, feature that allows you to ignore some of the findings using Rego. Okay, Rego, if you don't know, it's a policy language. Um, it's, it's the language that is used for the OPA, Open Policy Agent Graduated CNCF Project, very popular project. And Trivi allows you to define uh, exceptions using Rego. Okay, and Rego is like, it's, it's a real language. It's a very sophisticated uh, tool that you can express many different scenarios in. Um, there's a lot of um, a, a, a power in this language, basically. So uh, we're gonna see an example, a few examples for things we can do to ignore things, uh, to ignore findings using Rego. Let's go back to the terminal. Okay, so, um, Actually, before, we'll take a look at uh, the file here. This is a Rego file that I've written to ignore some of the uh, vulnerabilities that were uh, reported. And we see a few different examples here. First of all, I want to ignore any finding if the vulnerability ID is in this list of allowed CVEs. So I'm basically defining my own uh, allow list, and I'm saying everything here, I know about it, I'm acknowledging the risk, just don't tell me about it anymore. Um, and I'm also, just as an example for what you can do with a, a, a language like Rego, I'm setting an expiry date for this, uh, for this ignore. I'm saying ignore if the vulnerability is in allow list, but also consider that the time now is smaller than this date, just the date that I made up to say, after this date, it should resurface. The second example shows that uh, I want to ignore any vulnerability coming from this package. By package name, I'm just filtering. So I don't, in this case, I don't um, refer to the CVE ID. I just say, I don't know which CV is. If it's coming from the Bluetooth package, I don't care about it because I don't do anything with Bluetooth, so just allow it. And in the third example, something a little bit more um, fancy, um, the, the, the Trivi um, result includes something called the CVSS score. This is like, um, a standardized and coded string that includes a lot of information about the, um, the vulnerability itself, like what qualities does the vulnerability has, and uh, Trivi has a helper that parses this, this thing, and what I'm doing here is I'm ignoring anything if the attack vector is local. Basically, it means that this vulnerability requires local access to the machine, so, I'm saying, I don't know, we have extremely good uh, physical security. We're not afraid of this kind of attacks. So if it's, um, if it's um, exploitable over the network, yes, I want to know about it. But if it requires local access, don't tell me about it. So this is just a few examples that shows you some um, legitimate but subjective um, reasons to ignore 
vulnerabilities. Unlike the VEX examples we showed you like objectively, this is in every Python image, it's true that these kind of VEX statements are irrelevant. Here is things that I, as the developer, decided to ignore. So to make use of this, we're running the same command with the VEX document from before. Now we're adding another flag, ignore policy, and pointing to our rego file. And once we run this, we see even lower number, 114 vulnerabilities, and just two in our application because we accepted one um, by CVID. And another thing we can do to further uh, focus on the right ones is to add another special flag in Trivi that is called ignore unfixed. So this is just to systematically ignore any vulnerability that doesn't have a, a fix, so it's not actionable by us, so just don't tell me about it in the first place. So we'll run this, and now we get only 21 vulnerabilities in the base image and two from my application. Back to you, Tori. Ship it. Ship it. <laughs> With 21 vulnerabilities, yeah. Good one. Okay, uh, so we went through the VEX, right? So we took the VEX statement from the Python community, we applied to our image, we reduced from 165 to something like 160. Then we used uh, uh, the scanner's kind of uh, uh, capabilities in order to reduce the uh, kind of the noise even more. Uh, we went down to, what, 20-something, 20 21 vulnerabilities. Now, what do I do? I still have 21 vulnerabilities, like actually 21 in the base image and another two in my application. So, um, we have a tool uh, which actually is part of CNCF called Copacetic. So, this tool, Copacetic, what it does is it can patch in the image every OS-based vulnerability. Uh, what that means is it takes the original image, uh, um, it uh, uh, opens it, applies the package, the new packages, and then creates a new image uh, that has all these fixes uh, in it. In order to use the tool, the first thing we need to do is we need to actually create a vulnerability report that is read by the tool. Uh, I use Trivi to create the vulnerability report. Uh, I filter by only vulnerability type OS just because I don't want to create too, too big one. And uh, uh, the report gets saved in this particular um, uh, file name. So it runs pretty fast uh, and uh, you can go and actually see that the vulnerability report is available here. It reports all the OS based vulnerabilities which should be 21. Uh, what, we, what we've seen. Now I can go and run COPPA and as I said, so we run the COPPA tool, uh, we use our application image, we pass the vulnerability report to this application image and we specify the tag that we wanna use for our patched image. Once again, this is a completely new image, it's not your original app image. Um, Let's give it a kind of a minute to run, but uh, once again, so the, the COPPA uh, uses the standard uh, Docker build tools, uh, opens the image, applies the, uh, actually the fixes using the package managers. In this particular case, that will be the Debian package manager. And once it is done, it will save the image in GHCR with a new, actually, um, uh, tag. So let's go and take a look. And this should be, oh, so actually we didn't push the image yet. Um, having in mind that we are out of time, let's skip the pushing part. Um, now, if we go and run trivia again, and once again, we use the ignore unfixed, we use the vex statement, we use the ignore policy, and we sketch, uh, scan our patched image, we'll see that actually we have very few vulnerabilities that uh, we need to take care of. Okay, so as you can see, there are no vulnerabilities in the base image anymore. We are still left with the two vulnerabilities that we introduced as part of our image. And if it's, today is the, what, 27th, if it is 30th, we will see also the third one that we ignored in the uh, ignore policy, 3 ignore policy. 
Okay. Now, we went from 165 vulnerabilities. We used VEX, we used uh, uh, exceptions, uh, we used auto patching. Uh, and uh, uh, what is left for us? Of course, what is left is we still need to patch something. So, all the tools in the world will not help us actually avoid that work. Uh, if you, uh, for example, look at uh, what Trivi reports, Flask and uh, Werkzeug and actually Jinja are the, the three application level vulnerabilities that we needed to, to patch. We filed exception for the Flask one, but we still need to go and actually update our uh, requirements text file to next version of, uh, let's say, Jinja or Werkzeug in order to fix those remaining two vulnerabilities that get reported. So this is kind of the process that uh, you can use to actually get from a really huge number of vulnerabilities and really filter it down and make sure that your developers, because the developers will, will be interested in like these last two numbers, like what do I really need to do? Don't bother me with everything else. Everything else up to the last step is easily automatable. You can use VEX, you can use exception files, you can use COPPA for patching. This is the work that actually really needs to be do, done manually. And that is what needs to be shown to the developers. So a couple of learnings. Did I? Yeah. OK, so um, first thing, I mentioned PRL earlier. Um, it's this string that is used to uh, refer to the product. When used to refer to container images specifically, it might be a little bit um, um, counterintuitive, maybe, because you would expect that you would use, you, you would refer to the image in the same way that you refer to it, for example, in the docker run command or something like that. But it doesn't work like this because PRL has other rules. So for example, you cannot uh, say something like docker io slash python because the registry name is not part of the PRL spec. You cannot say something like library slash Python because the namespace or your user account is not part of the pure spec. You cannot even say Python and this version of Python uh, with the tag like you're used to from the Docker uh, run command because the version has a different way to uh, refer to it in the pure spec. So you can say Python like we did uh, earlier, but which Python? Because again, this is a vex statement that is supposed to help many people in the world to ignore a vulnerability. You don't want to say it applies to every version of Python. You want to say it's for these specific versions. And there is a, a way to refer to that in the PRL spec, like the name of the image, at sign, and the version. But then the version, again, it is not your the application level version. It is not the version that the Python maintainers decided. Um, it's not even the image ID, what you get from the Docker images command. It is called the repo digest. It is a, uh, a special, a unique ID that refers to this particular uh, image in this particular registry. So even if you retag the image or if you pull the image and push it to your private registry, it would get a different uh, repo digest. Depending on how you do it, actually. OCI mm -hmm. specified that you can preserve the digest. Right? Yeah. So uh, if you use docker pull, docker push, it will change the digest. But if you actually copy with tools like Auras, uh, Crane, and so on, the digest is preserved. Yeah. So basically, this is to say that uh, if you create VEX attestations for uh, container images, and you need to put something in the product ID there, take, a, take another look at the PRL specifications and see how you should actually uh, write the the, the product ID in order for it to work. Um, the second thing that is worth mentioning is it's kind of the elephant in the room through this entire talk because uh, we created a VEX document and then we handed it over to Trivi manually. But the real question you would ask yourself is where do I find this VEX for all of, the, all of my dependencies? So uh, we showed that the VEX is in a container registry. Uh, it works, of course, but uh, it raises some questions like which registry, in this case, m maybe the image exists in many different registries officially, and what if I mirrored it somewhere else? Um, actually, how, even if it's in the registry, to which exactly uh, digest of uh, image does it refer to? So it, it creates just a, uh, another set of problems, and not to mention what if my artifact is not a container image? What if I'm creating a VEX document for a package or a binary? 
Um, we've seen some examples for um, a VEX document um, provided by vendors for their products or open source products for the products uh, in a very um, um, bespoke and manual way. So for example, in our documentation, you will find a VEX document or send us an email and you'll get uh, the, the VEX document. This is obviously not scalable and uh, not very accessible. And uh, the last thing, and um, Adolfo also mentioned it in the keynote, that uh, we're starting to see open source projects adopting VEX um, as just a document in the source code repository. So if it's open source, if it's on GitHub, you, you'll start to see an open VEX document in some projects, just a file in the root uh, directory. Which is, it's, it's better than nothing, but again, you still need to know that it's there, you need to fetch it, you need to give it to the tool, to the scanning tool, and of course, not everything is open source, so what do you do about that? Um, there is no good solution, as far as we know it right now. We are working on this. Uh, we, I mean, uh, the Trivi team for the Trivi scanner, something we call VEX Hub. It will be a central repository for uh, all of the um, VEX uh, attestations that we can fetch for you, and it will be automatically integrated with Trivi. Stay tuned for that, it will be released quite soon. And a few other learnings. Uh, uh, first, like, you can pull the VEX from anywhere, as like uh, Itai said, but how do you verify integrity or authenticity of this VEX statement? Maybe somebody actually uh, hacked the, the registry or hacked the GitHub repository and changed it, right? Uh, using signatures uh, and signing those VEX statements will be important in the future, so you can trust and the tools will be working on also integrating like verification of those signatures. Once again, the tools are not magic bullet, as we said, so they will not do all the work for us. Despite all the AI hype and so on, there will be some manual work. The question is how do we reduce these big numbers of thousands of vulnerabilities that I see every day in the reports to something that I really need to concentrate and fix. Uh, data is sparse, as, as Itai said, like, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Adolfo said this morning, not everybody provides VEXs, right? And uh, we still need to work on kind of improving the whole process of how do we use VEX, where we store it, where to find it, but the most important thing is that we need to start actually producing those VEX statements so we can see more and more how they work, and right now there are too few of those. And once again, as, as the folks from the malicious compliance uh, uh, said yesterday, it's an honor system. So if Python community says that the Git uh, is uh, not impactful for their image, again, do you trust them? Do you not trust them? Verify the VEX statement. It's something that actually still needs uh, uh, some decision point to say, okay, is that trustable statement? Is it correct? Did they verify it? And, and so on. So that's everything we had. Sorry for running a little bit uh, uh, over, but any questions we can answer? Cool. So I noticed that um, the step to craft a uh, rego policy is manual. So let's say suppose you know, I'm doing you know after a breach and investigating some you know set of images. I crack open the first uh, you know the first image. I realize that a lot of them are false positives, and I want to take this. Images uh, VEX statement and generate a regal policy out of it. You know, like, do, do you guys have anything in the roadmap? You know, in the Trivi CLI to easily generate a regal policy. To, to again to generate the regal policy from what? Yeah, from a VEX statement. Basically. From a VEX. Yeah. Uh, why? Why would you do that? So the VEX already like you can ignore the things with the VEX. The 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 regal policy is more if you actually something is not already in the VEX and you want to add it. Like, so you can take one VEX statement and apply it to another image. Um, let's say suppose I want to take you know, a set of vulnerabilities and I know that I just want to apply it to a set of images. Oh, you're, you're talking about the step where we took the Python VEX statement and applied it to the flask cap yeah. image. Okay, that's not the ignore policy. Mm -hmm. That is again the same VEX statement, but the assumption for VEX is that the Python community, let's say, they went and said, like, we tested everything uh, on the Python and all the code parts, they never actually touched this Git library, okay? 
that's what the Python community said. So they verified all the thousands of, uh, hundreds of thousands of lines of Python code and they didn't find any reference to the Git library. That's why they created the VEX statement. Uh, that is not automatically transferable to our image right now. So theoretically, if I use the Python image and they testify that a uh, uh, Git uh, library is not used, that should apply to mine, but right now there is no this transient. That's why we needed to create separate VEX statement to refer to other product, which is the Flask image, that had exactly the same information as the Python one. And yeah, it's, it's a one line, so we use set to do replacement. Okay? Any other questions? Um, yeah. Go ahead. The, uh, what we did is up to the time that we run the Copacetic tool, it is the same image. It's just additional information that you can attach to the image, like the VEX statement or the uh, uh, ignore policy for Trivi. When we ran Copa, we took the original image, which was Flask 1.0, and we created a new image because you cannot actually modify the original image in the sense like the original image is always uh, the same. So we created a new image and we tagged it with flaskup 1.0-patch just to differentiate using the tag. Both images, they have different digests. So they, uh, we can override the 1.0 tag but uh, uh, just to demonstrate that those are two different images, are, uh, that's why we use different tag. Sometimes like you may not want to override the original tag because uh, uh, such like fixes may introduce breaking changes. And if you say refer in your Helm chart the original tag all the time, you may actually break something in production. <laughs> 